Yeah. So I'm going to uh, first talk about the requirements for constructing a realistic core collapse supernova model. So I, I took the title of the workshop, uh, uh, Computational Challenges, the first two words in particular, very seriously, and designed my talk around that. So uh, I'm going to really uh, spend more time talking about the challenges that we face, the things that uh, have, have not yet been done but need to be done, uh, more than uh, past progress. Uh, Pablo gave a very nice introduction to some of the f basic supernova physics. I know this group uh, understands uh, well uh, how core collapse supernovae work. Uh, I will take you on a deeper dive, uh, and a deeper dive from a, a modeler's perspective. Um, I'm going to talk about where the current state of the art is in three-dimensional modeling. And of course, uh, typical of our community, we talk more about our warts than about our beauty. And so uh, let me just say something very positive here, which is really quite important. Uh, I know Kay will agree that um, the uh, current three-dimensional modeling, it's a good time to be a supernova modeler because uh, the three-dimensional sophisticated models we have across the leading groups in the world uh, now have, have all demonstrated the efficacy of the neutrino heat reheating, shock reheating, uh, delayed shock mechanism that was first discovered by Jim Wilson in 1982. So Jim uh, was the pioneer uh, and uh, really set the stage for modeling since then. We still work within that neutrino shock reheating paradigm, which I'll talk about in, in, in depth. Um, and this has been demonstrated by across groups, across progenitors of different characteristics, progenitor mass, rotation, metallicities. Um, and uh, I've been doing this for a long enough time to know that uh, when I started out, the only person, only group that was obtaining explosions was the Livermore group, Lawrence Livermore group, where Jim Wilson was based. Uh, and that was because of the invocation of something called neutron fingers, which I'll talk about later on. Without neutron fingers, which is a proto-neutron star instability, uh, without that invoked in, a, in the context of spherically symmetric modeling, with mixing ring theory, phenomenologically modeled in, in spherical symmetry. Without that, he did not see explosions. So to be in a situation like now, where you know, Kay and I and others uh, working on, hard on this uh, are, obtain explosions through the neutrino reheating mechanism uh, is very encouraging, needless to say. Uh, it's, uh, it's a happy time. <laughs> it wasn't always a happy time. Uh, and so I want to share that with you uh, because I think sometimes outside of our community, when I go to the general astronomy astrophysics community, uh, I, I don't think the, the broader community understands the progress that has been made uh, by our field. I think they, they still see us as a bunch of squabbling groups all getting different answers and disagreeing, and that's not the case. I remember uh, speaking with Fulvio Ricci uh, in Rome in 2010. Uh, and, uh, and then again, I saw him at the LVC, at the time it was the LVC meeting, Kay and I were both there, in Pasadena. So seven years later, uh, and I presented work on behalf of the whole supernova community there, and he came up to me, and uh, at the end he said, wow, he said, you know, from when I saw you last in 2010 to now, there's been a great deal of progress. Uh, and in fact, uh, he said, there's even a template, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that now. Uh, but, uh, but I think uh, this is a, a very good period. Uh, it's being propelled by the gravitational wave astronomy and astrophysics community. So thank you on behalf of uh, supernova modelers world, worldwide. Um, none, nonetheless, there are some big gaps, <laughs> uh, significant challenges that remain and have to be addressed. So I'm going to talk about what those are. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how we, our group, intends to address those. Uh, then I'm going to go into uh, the results from our current three-dimensional core collapse supernova models. So we have sort of two tracks uh, at the University of Tennessee Oak Ridge National Laboratory group. One is production and one is development. The development is about next generation. Uh, I'll talk about briefly about that as well to kind of show you where we're headed and give you some preliminary results. 
Uh, all, it's all about our efforts to address the gaps that, that we have. Um, then uh, I'm going to uh, talk about something that frightened me to death, as a, particularly as a neutrino transport modeler. Uh, and that is the possible need to extend neutrino classical kinetics, which as you'll, you will hopefully see is hard enough to say the least, to neutrino quantum kinetics, which would uh, keep uh, several generations of our children and their children occupied. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that's going to be needed. but. Uh, but you know, we can only do what we can do now and take one step at a time and go from there. Progress has been made. The first numerical simulations of supernovae were performed by Sterling Colgate, another pioneer like Jim Wilson and White, in, and published in 1966. We are 55 years in, and what I've learned from this problem is it's a, uh, it, as we make progress, we make progress, but the problem becomes more complex as well. The goalposts are, are moving right from us. Uh, so, so that's something we have to, we have to be willing to, to accept. Uh, now, you know, we used to talk about solving the supernova problem. Uh, that statement is becoming more and more meaningless uh, as we go on. Uh, and this is really all about making progress on a very significant multi-physics rich uh, phenomenon in nature, uh, from which in turn, through observations, we might be able to extend our knowledge even of fundamental nuclear and particle physics. This is a neutrino environment like no other, as, we, as we'll talk about, particularly when it comes to the issue of neutrino quantum kinetics, okay? So that's the outline. <laughs> All right, so um, to, based on what Pablo talked about, uh, and uh, some of this uh, David alluded to earlier as well. So let's talk about how this game works. And I, I know for some of you this is a review, for some it might be new. Uh, but we, we basically have a shock wave that forms through stellar core collapse and rebound. The iron core of a massive star reaches its Chandrasekhar limit, it collapses, it com uh, comprises nuclei, nucleons, electrons, uh, some positrons, photons, uh, and as the collapse proceeds, you exceed uh, nuclear densities. For symmetric nuclear matter, it's 2.7, 10 to the 14. This is going to be somewhat asymmetric, so it'll be a little lower. At those densities, a phase transition occurs from nuclei and nucleons to nucleons, bulk nuclear matter. Collapse continues. Eventually, the compression brings the nucleons uh, close enough together that the hard core and the nucleon-nucleon interaction potential is felt. There are also fermions. They don't like to be squeezed together. And the result of that physics uh, causes the pressure uh, to uh, increase dramatically as a function of density. We say that the core stiffens. There's a rebound. And that rebound launches the shock wave. And the shock wave ultimately will propagate out of the star to disrupt it in a core collapse supernova. I just said that in two minutes, and we've been working on this problem for 55 years. So there must be more to the story than that. Uh, and so we'll talk about that today. Okay, so we have a stalled supernova shock wave. The shock wave stalls because as the nuclei pass through it in the core, they're dissociated. We lose about an explosion energy, 10 to the 51 ergs for every tenth of a solar mass dissociated. We have many tenths of solar masses to propagate through. Uh, and then when the shock reaches the neutrino sphere, the electron neutrino sphere, neutrinos are produced uh, during collapse and post bounce uh, profusely of all three flavors. When that happens, then you get an escape uh, of energy from the, due to the neutrino losses, and that, that really puts the nail in the final nail in the coffin, and the shock becomes an accretion shock. So you have here an accretion shock. You have here at the center, the star of the day. It's the proto-neutron star, which will go on to form a neutron star or a black hole. Uh, it comprises the cold, unshocked inner core and a hot, shocked mantle of material that's not ejected. It is radiating neutrinos of all three flavors, electron, muon, and tau, and the antineutrino partners at 10 to the 52 ergs per second. The gravitational binding energy 
uh, of the neutron star goes into the energy of neutrinos, and we want to tap some of that energy to re-energize the shock and cause the supernova. Uh, for those who like uh, uh, English slash American units, that's 10 to the 45 watts. So it's a neutrino bulb of 10 to the 45 watts. And the uh, idea, which was discovered by Jim Wilson, uh, accidentally, as it turns out, uh, in a numerical simulation that he left running, uh, he came back the next day and he found that the shock had been revived. Uh, there's a guardian angel in the universe, I think. Uh, and the, he found that basically what happens is this uh, f a flux of neutrinos that's emanating from this central object um, due to charged current electron neutrino and antineutrino absorption on the neutrons and protons. Now, these, remember, these neutrons and protons were liberated from the nuclei that got dissociated. So nature worked against us in causing the shock to stall but now nature will work with us in causing the shock to be revived. So uh, electron neutrinos and antineutrinos uh, are absorbed, literally, uh, on the protons and neutrons and uh, redeposit the energy that was lost when the shock uh, was dissociated in the nuclei and when the electron neutrino burst occurred. So the, the, the fundamental idea, the, the idea behind the delayed shock mechanism, it's a shock that forms but doesn't promptly exit the star, is to revive it by neutrino heating, literally heating. Literally, uh, we're going to boil, boil the uh, core of the star, okay? Now, that's not the whole story. Mother Nature is not spherically symmetric. Uh, obviously, we have a region here between the, this, the surface of the proto-neutron star is referred to as the neutrino sphere, but neutrino interactions are energy and flavor dependent, and so it's actually a set of spheres uh, depending on neutrino flavor and energy. But because there's a density cliff here, a sharp density cliff, uh, the, the uh, neutrino spheres are close together within a few kilometers of one another of an object that's of order 30 kilometers, so about 10% of the, of the uh, radius uh, of the proto-neutron star, okay? So these neutrino, this neut I'll refer to it as the neutrino sphere. So the neutrino sphere, between the neutrino sphere surface and the shock, we have a net heating region and a net cooling region. The charged current reactions that I talked about before also lead to cooling, and the heating and cooling functions have different radial dependencies. As a result, you have a net heating region and a net cooling region. Matter will, uh, as a result of the, the net heating region, you have a source of energy below, you're heating, you're boiling the star, you develop convection. That's known as neutrino-driven convection. There are also instabilities that occur within the proto-neutron star that we'll talk about at, in greater length later. Uh, some of those modes are convection modes, and some are what, uh, something much more uh, complex uh, and, uh, and uh, tricky, and those are known as doubly diffusive instabilities. Okay? So there are multiple instabilities that can develop within the proto-neutron star. They can serve a role to boost the neutrino luminosity, the, the, the heating source. Uh, but uh, this is the neutrino-driven convection mode that acts in the post-shock region. Um, now, this, this mode of convection is, um, I'm showing here, unlike what Pablo showed, I'm showing a nice spherical shock, but eventually the shock is distorted from sphericity. Uh, this uh, convection helps to, uh, it, it renders the neutrino heating efficient in the sense that hot matter, where energy is deposited, which is deposited largely at the base of the heating region because the flux of neutrinos falls off as one over R squared, uh, that matter is brought up to the shock, the post-shock region, the immediate post-shock region, where it can help to do work on the material ahead of the shock. Uh, essentially, whether or not the shock moves is uh, a function of the jump conditions. For it to be a dynamical shock and move outward, the, uh, the differential across in pressure, for example, internal energy has to be uh, significantly large. Okay? So this, this convection will help with this neutrino heating, in addition, uh, the convection becomes turbulent uh, in 3D. In 2D, it does that. It likes to, the cascade goes in opposite directions in 2D. In 3D, cascade goes uh, to smaller scales, the turbulent cascade. 
it becomes turbulent, and we now know that turbulence uh, also has an impact, a very important impact, on the shock dynamics. The turbulent stresses, the turbulent pressure, can rival or exceed the thermal pressure uh, of the matter uh, due to neutrino heating. This is work, uh, extensive work David has done on this to, to, uh, to demonstrate that this is really critically important. So not only do we have convection, but the turbulence that ensues as a result of shear uh, also contributes further to, uh, to buoying the shock and ultimately propelling the shock outward. Um, the standing accretion shock instability, the SASE, uh, which we discovered in 2002 and published in 2003, uh, essentially is a, an instability of the shock wave itself. Prior to that, we didn't really think about the stability of the shock. We thought about the stability of the fluid beneath the shock. But the shock wave is unstable to perturbations that are non-spherical, and those perturbations grow. Uh, and in uh, three dimensions, the dominant, uh, perturb the dominant modes are L equal one, which is a sloshing mode, and there's an M equal one, a spiral mode. In 2D, there's only a sloshing mode, not a spiral mode, okay? Um, so that the SASE will distort this shock. Uh, if it's L equal one, it, it may extend the heating region in this direction and not so much in this direction, but in any event, the SASE uh, uh, leads to uh, assist the neutrino heating in multiple ways, one of which, for example, is to uh, increase the size of the heating region, okay? So all of this stuff is going on uh, as far as the fluid instabilities are concerned and the shock instability, but that's not the end of the story yet. Uh, we're fortunate, as Pablo said, that 99% of massive stars uh, are slowly rotating, that the 1%, the rapidly rotating cases, are something that we can uh, maybe put off to later, because actually you have to do all of this physics first in order to consider the case where there's rapid rotation, where magnetic fields, as I'll describe in a second, can dominate. Uh, so we have a rotation to consider, and rotation, of course, is important generally. It's obvious. There are centrifugal effects and things like that. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, we have magnetic fields, which uh, I've poorly shown here. Uh, and magnetic fields, too, because of the turbulence, uh, can be, magnetic field strains can be ramped up significantly. In some of the studies that we conducted in our group, uh, we saw magnetic field strengths of 10 to the 14 Gauss, beginning with st uh, field strengths of order 10 to the 10 Gauss. So turbulence can amplify those magnetic fields. Uh, and uh, folks like Martin uh, Obergallinger um, and also uh, Kay and, and, and his uh, collaborators, uh, uh, Kurota-san and Takiwaki and Kay, have shown here recently uh, that uh, the, even in cases where there is not a lot of rotation, uh, the magnetic fields have, have, can have a big enough impact to b decide between explosion or non-explosion in a given for a given progenitor. Okay, so this is a situation where we're not, we do not have rapid rotation. We're not amplifying. We're not amplifying fields and organizing them, collimating the fields. Uh, you need uh, rapid rotation for that, but yet the magnetic fields are non-negligible. Okay, so magnetic fields have to be added, period. Uh, and then, of course, we have the 1% of cases where the uh, object is rapidly rotating, in which case the rotational energy can be tapped. That energy can go into magnifying the field strengths, organizing the fields, and driving, uh, as uh, in some of the uh, things that uh, uh, David showed earlier, driving collimated outflows through MHD D effects, MHD stresses, okay? Now, even in that instance, the models are not sophisticated enough now. Uh, the models that, um, without magnetic fields, uh, until recently, we're well ahead of the models with magnetic fields. And we don't know if there's a spectrum, right, where neutrinos dominate and then uh, they, they share responsibility with the magnetic fields and then magnetic fields dominate, or whether there's more of a, just a, a really quick dividing line be, between the two, the two instances. The models are not well enough developed for us to be able to determine that. So 
But bottom line is uh, the, the magnetic fields have to be present as well. They have to be present. OK, so that's the story. <laughs> now, everything has to be general relativistic. Uh, and and you, you, it'll be humorous, humorous good in life, right? It'll be humorous to see how that's treated in some of the, the current state-of-the-art supernova models. This is, we've known this for 20 years. So after we developed a fully general relativistic supernova capability in the context of spherical symmetry, we were able to then check the difference between a Newtonian, purely Newtonian case and a purely a full GR case. And you see here, for a 25 solar mass progenitor model, uh, on the left is the Newtonian case, and on the right is the general relativistic case. Here is the, uh, the supernova shock wave, the stall shock wave, in both instances. Uh, this is the, um, oh, I'm sorry, here's the, of course, here's the supernova shock wave, and here's the supernova shock wave in the general relativistic case. That's the heating region, that's the heating region, this is the cooling region, that's the cooling region, that's the PNS radius, that's the PNS radius. Uh, and the arrows, the, the arrows indicate infall, and the length of the arrows is non uh, indicates the magnitude of the infall. So in the general relativistic case, you have a much more significant infall velocity. You have a much smaller heating region, and therefore much less time to heat the material. Because if it's not heat, if you don't deposit sufficient energy before it hits the cooling region, it cannot explode. It cannot be unbound. It's doomed to accrete onto the proto-neutron star, okay? I'm sorry, I can't understand. So in this particular instance, um, I'm trying to remember the metric we use in spherical symmetry. Um, it, uh, it might have been uh, the misner sharp metric that we use in spherical symmetry in this model. It doesn't, it doesn't matter in this case, right? So, so we have, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, so, so let, in the case, uh, so generally speaking, uh, it, mother nature is general relativistic. So obviously if it, mother nature is general relativistic, if I claim an explosion, it should be from a model that is general relativistic. Now, the difference between explosion and failure, uh, it generally, general relativity uh, is helpful. But it's a, it's a, a nonlinear competition of effects. So let me just finish this up, and then it'll speak to that excellent question. So here you have, of course, uh, more substantial infall. You have a smaller heating region. Uh, but at the same time, the neutrino RMS energies emanating from the proto-neutron star are higher because it's coming from a more compact, hotter proto-neutron star. But on the other hand, you have redshift of neutrinos, which takes energy away. So you have, multi you have pluses and minuses, and at the end of the day, you simply have to do it and compare. Okay? And what I'm showing you here uh, is just that Mother Nature is not Newtonian. And some of the three-dimensional models that have been, are out there, which are useful, beneficial, are purely Newtonian models, okay? Ultimately, we have to have a purely G, uh, general relativistic model, okay? So, so uh, Mother Nature tells us, and this is a 25 solar mass progenitor. The 15 is not quite as dramatic as this, but of course, we have progenitors that are larger than 25 solar mass. We don't know, we want to know where the demarcation line is, if there is one, between explosion and failure, you know, where that is. We want to be able to pin down those things like that quantitatively. Okay, so, so that's the gravity sector. In the, uh, we talked about the need for magnetohydrodynamics. We talked about the need for turb uh, to model turbulence, the SASE, rotation and the impacts of magnetic fields, and this has to be general relativistic as well. You can't have general relativistic gravity and Newtonian MHD or Newtonian gravity and, and general relativistic MHD. It makes no sense. There are all kinds of effects that occur in the MHD sector uh, that uh, you know, would not be captured if it were not a, a general relativistic treatment. Uh, finally, uh, and of course, this is, this is a lot of work, as, as David and others have, have discussed. Uh, 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 that's a lot of work already. 
But now we get to the 800-pound gorilla. The 800-pound gorilla is that we have to have a general relativistic treatment of neutrino kinetics. So uh, the neutrino heating, there are two terms here. One is for the electron neutrinos, and one is for the electron antineutrinos. I'll talk about one of them. It applies to both. Uh, these are a function, of course, of the mass fraction of, of neutrons and protons, obviously. This is just a physical constant. Um, the luminosity of the neutrino, so the brighter the bulb, the more heating you have. This is the square of the RMS energy, so the more energetic the neutrinos, the more energy deposition. And this is the uh, inverse flux factor, which is a measure of the isotropy or anisotropy of the neutrinos in their propagation directions in the heating region. So if you have a neutrino that's moving radially outward, it'll spend less time than a neutrino moving uh, laterally here in the heating region. So the more isotropic the distribution of neutrino angles, the more heating you have, okay? So those are the three quantities on which this neutrino shock revival paradigm sits, okay? Now, in order to know all of these quantities well, uh, and we're talking, and the supernova problem is a problem that's sensitive to 10% effects, as we know from many instances in the 55 years. In order to know these well, uh, we have to ultimately know the neutrino distribution function which is a seven-dimensional object at a time t and spatial location r theta phi in the heating region. Uh, it gives us the spectrum and it gives us the distribution in angles of propagation. In 3D, you need two angles. Uh, we use typically a direction cosine and an angle to uniquely specify a direction. So uh, this distribution function classically is obtained by the solution of the Boltzmann kinetic equation. It is, uh, it is, the supernova problem has now become a problem not just in three space plus time, but in phase space, 6D phase space plus time. Uh, this is not feasible now. There are some heroic efforts uh, from uh, uh, um, uh, Akaho et al. and Iwakami et al. Uh, Kay has been involved in some of these efforts. Uh, my friend Sumi Sumiyoshi-san has been involved in some of these efforts that have developed three-dimensional Boltzmann solvers, but they, their use now is limited to looking at certain very limited epochs of the, of the supernova. It's not feasible to carry out a, a full-blown supernova model with uh, Boltzmann kinetics. And as we'll see later on, if it becomes quantum kinetics, it's even, even more, more problematic. So the next thing, the next best thing, the thing that is feasible, is to forego some of the angular information. So we're going to create moments, angular moments of the distribution function. Z here is the collapsed version of R theta phi and energy. So we're going to keep the spectral information. Okay, the heating rate depends on the square of the RMS energy, so it's most sensitive to the spectra. We're going to keep the spectral information. We call that multi-frequency or spectral. Uh, and we're going to integrate out omega, which is an integral over both angles. And we're going to create two moments, the number density and the number flux, uh, basically by weighting this by one or by a unit vector L. OK? So uh, H has three, three components, right? So you have four moments here. Now, clearly, because I'm computing the flux in three dimensions, I'm keeping uh, some of the angular information. I'm keeping the most important. I'm keeping the lowest order modes. Okay, so I'm not throwing away all the angular information, but I am throwing away everything above uh, what we call the first two moments. It's actually, uh, it's really four moments because this has three dimensions to it. So the problem is, uh, so this is feasible now. And the state of the art now is about uh, conducting, you know, uh, general, quasi general relativistic, as we'll see, or fully general relativistic two moment supernova simulations with, with, uh, with this sort of moment uh, kinetics versus the Boltzmann kinetics. Now, when you integrate uh, the Boltzmann equation over angles and weight it, you, do, you find the equations for. I and H, 
But the equations for i and h depend on the next higher moment, and actually even the moment above that, but I'll list, illustrate the point with the next higher moment. This is uh, a, a moment k. Uh, it is weighted by the tensor product of L, so L i L j, okay? So it's a two component uh, tensor. Uh, and this uh, is not evolved, right? I and h are evolved, but not k, and k is in the system. It's like the pressure in the hydrodynamics equations. If you don't have an equation of state that relates the pressure to the density, for example, you can't close the system and solve it. This is the same thing. So this requires a closure prescription. And that's, um, that's a non-trivial enterprise. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that, closing the system of moment equations. We are forced to deal with this closure problem because we cannot do the Boltzmann problem, okay? So what's typically done, and this is where M1 comes in, as David mentioned, M1. M1 is essentially about stipulating that K, little k, which is a normalized version of K, is given by this expression. Uh, this expression arises if you assume that the, uh, the, ra the, the radiation field is symmetric about the direction singled out by H the flux factor, h, which is the flux divided by the magnitude of flux. It's a unit vector in the direction of the net flux of radiation. And if you assume that the radiation uh, field is symmetric about that, which is not an unreasonable assumption, it's not right, but it's not an unreasonable assumption, then it turns out that k can be expressed in this fashion where this uh, parameter uh, chi uh, is, uh, is a parameter, it's, a, it's a, a scalar, and it's known as the Eddington factor, okay? Uh, I'm talking to you about how, how this system, how we would close this system using uh, such a closure prescription, uh, basically by specifying k in terms of i and h, right? I've now specified this moment in terms of these two. So I've closed the system. And there's a par further parameter in here within M1, there are different choices of chi. So there are lots of versions of M1 here, and we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about those, okay? And then finally, the, let's not forget the microphysics, what we call them, this is the macrophysics, let's not forget the microphysics. So there's an extensive set of neutrino weak interactions involved in this. And there is no shortcut to that. We've, this, has been, this has been demonstrated over and over in the literature over 55 years. Not only does the complete set need to be included, but the state-of-the-art treatments of each interaction need to be included. So it's a two-fold two, two -fold whammy that you have to include all of the weak interactions. We'll talk about why that's, problem, why that's hard computationally. And you have to include the state-of-the-art treatments of those interactions. Okay? All of this is what defines uh, necessary model components. And I'm not even talking here about the need for three-dimensional progenitors, okay, which, is, uh, which is also true, except that I'm looking for the stellar evolution community to give us those. Okay, so I'm going to you know, uh, pawn off some of the, some of the work to a, to a different modeling community, all right? So a deeper look. And this is something that uh, we have been have worked a lot on, and, and I hope other supernova groups will begin to work on this as well. Um, there is an issue of realizability. Neutrinos are fermions. They obey Fermi-Dirac statistics. And it is a, very important in the models that the models be developed to respect Fermi-Dirac statistics, okay? I'm gonna talk in a second about lepton number conservation, energy conservation, all the things we know and love. Fermi-Dirac statistics is right up there with them. Mother nature, neutrinos are Fermi-Dirac particles, okay? And I'm gonna show you that what's being used in the, in, the, uh, mom in the closure prescriptions that are being used currently in, in the three-dimensional supernova models all violate uh, Fermi-Dirac statistics, okay? All right, so the, it, basically this means that the distribution function has to be bounded. It's between zero and one. Therefore, the moments are bounded, okay? And ultimately, uh, as I'll describe, the closure has to be realizable in the sense that the Eddington factor, 
which is a function or functional of the moments, is also bounded. Okay? So just as an example, here is the number density versus the number flux. And from Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics, the red region is all the, the admissible region. That the, uh, basically the number density and flux can uh, be as large as you wish, but they're constrained, of course, uh, at, at the bottom end by the speed of light restriction. Okay? So the, the flux cannot exceed the number density. Okay? That's, that's not allowed okay, from Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics. But for Fermi statistics, deep in the supernova core, where the neutrinos are in equilibrium with the matter, the equilibrium distribution function is a Fermi-Dirac distribution function. And uh, essentially, even at finite temperature, up to the neutrino chemical potential, the amount of energy needed to add a neutrino to the system, it, the distribution function is one. It's one for all angles. So that means that if you then compute the flux, which sums over the neutrino distribution weighted by the angle over all angles, you'll have plus and minus angles, the flux will be zero. So at low occupancies, the, uh, at low occupancies, the neutrino, the, the realizable domain, that is, within this domain, you're physical. Outside of this domain, you've broken Fermi-Dirac statistics. At low occupancies, you expect to obey, follow the, uh, the, the uh, trend of Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics. But as you get to high occupancies, uh, the Fermi-Dirac Fermi statistic constrains the flux to be back to be zero and the number density uh, to be one, normalized, absolutely normalized. So it's a much more complex uh, and restrictive domain and this is actually in a static medium. When you add velocity to this, this gets distorted left or right, becomes much more complex. And you have to keep your moments in this blue region as you evolve your supernova model. And that is an extremely challenging numerically, numerical uh, thing to do, which we'll, we'll talk about, okay? Um, the Eddington factor is also bounded. So here's the Eddington factor plotted against the flux factor. Uh, and these are all, and this is low occupancy and this is high occupancy. And these are all the closures that have been used in the supernova models. Minerbo is the most popular one, the blue one. Now at, at low occupancy, this is the boundary of the realizable domain. Everything above is fine. Everything below is not fine. All of the closures do pretty well here with a low occupancy, but when you go to the high occupancy case, there's only one closure, Chernohorsky and Bloodman, which is based on Fermi-Dirac statistics. It's a maximum entropy closure, but it's based on Fermi-Dirac statistics. That remains realizable. The Minerbo is among these. All of them violate Fermi-Dirac statistics at high occupancies. So now you're talking about violating Fermi-Dirac statistics deep in the core of the star, up to including potentially the semi-transparent region around the neutrino spheres. This is not a good place to violate Fermi-Dirac statistics, okay? So this, uh, this is a deeper dive into some of the physical and therefore numerical challenges that we face in developing not just three-dimensional models of supernovae, but physically high-fidelity faithful models of core collapse supernovae. I mentioned earlier, we know that lepton number is conserved, total lepton number. Even if a particular uh, flavor lepton number changes, the total lepton number is conserved, and we know that energy is conserved. Just to give you an idea of why, I mean, physically we know this, so our models need to make this happen, period. But the, uh, where the shock forms, Initially, the initial conditions of shock formation in the core depends on the deleptonization of the core during collapse. As electrons are captured on protons and nuclei, and electron neutrinos are emitted and escape, the core becomes less lepton rich, and the more that happens, the deeper the shock forms. The weaker it is upon bounce, because you have a smaller piston, and the more it has to plow through in the outer core to get out, okay? 
the energy is going to be, that's obvious, right? Energy conservation is going to have everything to do with the neutrino shock reheating and, and shock dynamics. So clearly, uh, just from those two physical points of view, we have to do both. Now, this is a significant technical challenge to develop discretizations of the integral partial differential equations that govern the evolution of the supernova to do both of these simultaneously. It's very challenging to do. It's something we've been working on for many years. Uh, in fact, it's required us to go and actually modify or extend the theory. We went back, you know, the, the derivations by, classic derivations by Lindquist and Ehlers and others of kinetic theory, general relativistic kinetic theory, are not sufficient. We had to go back and essentially reformulate general relativistic kinetic theory in a way that rendered the, the final equation, which is the replacement of the Boltzmann equation, uh, in manifestly conservative form, okay, for neutrino number. And in this case, that's the collision term, and the left-hand side is a streaming operator. This corresponds to spatial transport, and this corresponds to uh, momentum space transport. Red shift would be in here, and moving from radius one to radius two would be in here. And when you integrate over phase space, of all six dimensions of phase space, uh, basically you have a total divergence in the phase space sense, and you have conservation modulo surface terms. This, this was a lot of work to basically get general relativistic kinetic theory for continuum uh, equations to the point where then we could uh, more wisely discretize them in the hopes of sustaining such conservation numerically. Okay. Uh, the, the three plus one versions of these are, are delineated here. Uh, uh, Shibata-san has done work in this area as well. And for a review of all of the issues I'm talking about, uh, please see this 174-page um, review that we wrote. Okay, so, so that's, I've just delineated what's necessary. So let me talk now about where we are, okay? So uh, with the exception of a couple of heroic Boltzmann efforts, uh, everything here is in the, done in the context of uh, one or two moment kinetics, okay? So we have basically, uh, things group in f basically four categories. We have, uh, of the three-dimensional models I referred to earlier, some are Newtonian from a gravitational perspective. Uh, some use, let me speak, stick with gravity first. Some use what's called an effective potential. So we're in that category. And what that is is, 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 is a totally ad hoc prescription procedure okay, that needs to go. You take the Poisson equation, you solve it for Newtonian self-gravity in the system. You, if you imagine the Poisson, the, the potential being expanded in, in spherical harmonics, you take the monopole term L equals zero, M equals zero, and you replace that Newtonian monopole term with uh, something that essentially is an integral version of the tolman oppenheimer volkov equation. So you take the tolman oppenheimer volkov equation, express it in integral form, it suggests that there's a potential phi gr given by this expression. Uh, the quantities here, the pressure, the density, et cetera, are obtained from a 3D simulation by spherical averaging. So we take the data from the supernova model, that's 3D, we spherically average to provide the input for this. And you can see here now, as in the Einsteinian case, uh, gravity is a manifestation of things like pressure, uh, energy, not just rest mass, as in the Newtonian case. And you essentially take this monopole and you replace the Newtonian monopole. That's how, that's how it's done. And that is completely ad hoc completely ad hoc, okay? So uh, all models, including ours, that use this approach have to advance to fully, full general relativity. Okay, then finally, we do have efforts. Uh, Kay has been involved in those. Uh, Kuroda-san has, has uh, been the lead author on those that are uh, fully general relativistic. Luke Roberts uh, as well. So there have been a few uh, full, uh, fully general relativistic uh, treatments, which is where we all need to be from the standpoint of gravity. 
Then there, from the neutrino transport sector, there's a thing called ray by ray transport. Uh, ray by ray transport, uh, the name is misleading because it would suggest that you allow neutrinos to propagate only in the radial direction out or in. But in reality, radial ray by ray transport means that instead of solving one three dimensional transport problem, you solve uh, n sub theta times n sub phi, where n sub theta is the number of theta zones you have in your grid, and n sub phi is the number of phi zones. So for every two tuple within that set, uh, you solve a spherically symmetric problem. Okay, so neutrinos are allowed to propagate laterally, like this one. It propagates radially and laterally. It's just that if you're doing this as a set of spherically symmetric problems, for each of those problems, you're neglecting lateral transport. So you're throwing away some of the transport. The reason this was developed is because the spherically symmetric models, the transport codes were quite sophisticated. And so this was first uh, proposed and done by Max Planck Group. We have followed suit on that. Uh, and our current production chimera code production runs are based on that ray by ray transport. Now, this is, if the, if the source is spherically symmetric, ray by ray is exact. Okay, every ray is the same, but if you, for example, have a hot spot here and it persists, the ray by ray is going to treat this entire subtended surface as hot. So it's gonna overestimate the neutrino heating here in the, heat, in the gain region, okay? Similarly, uh, if this is cold, relatively speaking, it's going to assume that this whole subtended region is cold and it's gonna underestimate the heating there. So you're gonna get very, uh, you're gonna get strong angular variations uh, over and underestimating the heating. Now, if these spots change rapidly, when an accretion funnel hits the proto-neutron star surface, it heats it up, but, but, but there's a big splash that spreads rather rapidly. Uh, if, if, this is, if these hot spots don't persist, you can do actually reasonably well with the ray-by-ray -ray treatment. And this was shown here by the Max Planck group where they compared ray by ray and non ray by ray, three dimensional transport and ray by ray transport in the context of, of you know, one study, few couple of runs, uh, limited neutrino physics, but nonetheless, they basically found that the ray by ray did quite well, which is good. That's not to say it should be kept, it needs to go. <laughs> but it's, it's encouraging to know that it did well because then a lot of the conclusions that we've already made based on the current three-dimensional models still stand, okay? But eventually, this is a limited setting, a limited number of checks on the approximation. Uh, we have a lot of stars to evolve, a lot of observables to predict, and you just can't have approximations like that in the, in the models anymore, okay? Uh, on the effective uh, potential approach, this is a study from uh, Evald, uh, not uh, Bernhard Mueller and Tomas and, and Andreas Marek. Uh, and uh, this is a case where they compared actually the effective potential approach to a fully general relativistic approach. And the black curve is the fully general relativistic approach. And this is the shock radius versus time. So this is an explosion to go back to your question on how uh, you not only the physics competition in the physics, but also the modeling of the physics can enter in in this problem. This is a case that exploded, whereas the, uh, the effect of potential treatment did not. It did not. So there, there was a qualitative change in the outcome, not just quantitative, but qualitative change uh, using the effective potential, uh, ad hoc effective potential versus a, a you know, the, the coconut code that what Bernhard uh, has used, which is a fully general heuristic. So, so, uh, so that's, that's ray by ray. Then, of course, there are three, the models with three-dimensional transport that don't do ray by ray, which is great. So um, now let's talk about the uh, weak interaction physics. So we have partial, extensive, extensive, partial. So this is what I was referring to earlier. Uh, I love these models. These are my favorite models, not mine, but these, okay? But these are not realistic enough yet. And they don't have enough weak interaction physics in them yet. They will. I know K. Okay. They will, but they're not there yet. And there's a reason for, uh, one reason at least, for why this, is, this happens. When you uh, take the kinetic equations and you discretize them, 
uh, and you solve them, you wind up with uh, ultimately a linear system of equations to solve, many of them of such systems over and over and over again, okay? Let's ignore the, the black bands because that, that occurs uh, if you treat the uh, uh, spatial advection, spatial transport implicitly, right? If on the other hand, uh, you only do the collision term in emission absorption scattering implicitly, which you have to, then you just have these uh, dense blocks, at the, these blocks at the center, okay? Material interaction time scales are extremely rapid. There's no way you can advance your simulation in an explicit manner using what you know on time step n to get something on time step n plus one when you have such stiff systems of equations, okay? You have to do it implicitly. When you do it implicitly, you're led to having to deal with these blocks. Now, if you have just uh, coupling and angle, where the neutrino scattering couples the angle only, so a neutrino scatters an angle, so two angles are coupled, all right? Then you have these little dense blocks on the diagonal. If, in addition, you then allow coupling and energy, neutrino electron scattering, for example, because of the low rest mass of the electrons, transfers a lot of energy from the neutrino, as well as angle, then you have bigger blocks. You're coupling across all of your angle and energy bins in your model. Then if you go to pair processes where E plus E minus goes to say nu E nu E bar, you're now cross-coupling in isospin in the sense you're cross-coupling nu E and nu E bar. And then finally, if you allow, uh, and we have to, neutrino-neutrino interactions, you can cross-couple in flavors, electron, mu, and tau. So your blocks get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the dominant, by far the dominant, I mean it just dwarfs everything else, uh, cost of a numerical simulation of a supernova has to do with dealing with these dense blocks. So that's why weak interaction physics uh, in some of these pioneering studies, you know, is cut back because, you know, you, you, your simulations are much less costly. But nonetheless, Mother Nature is charging you anyway, right? So you've, you've got to do it. So this is hopefully gives you a sense of where the state of the art is. Uh, it's exciting, right? Exciting time, but there's clearly a lot of work to be done. There's some real uh, duct, there's duct tape here, a lot of duct tape, okay, in these models, and that has to go. So um, how much time do I have, Marco? Okay, all right. So I'm just going to briefly say a few things. Uh, this is our uh, code lineage. We have Chimera, which is, uses the effective potential, ray-by-ray -ray transport, no magnetic fields, and extensive weak physics. And then we have what's called Thornado. Eirik Endeva, who's from Norway, is the lead developer, hence the name. Uh, Dr. Thor is what we refer to him as. And this is going to have, uh, this already has general relativistic gravity in the XCFC approximation. CCZ4 uh, is under development. It uh, has general relativistic hydrodynamics in place in the XCFC approximation. MHD is under development. It has partial weak physics. Uh, extensive weak physics, of course, is under development. And it also now has three-dimensional transport that is fully special relativistic and will soon be general relativistic. So within about a year, uh, we hope to be in the realm where we're doing full 3D in every aspect, full GR in every aspect, at least with partial weak physics, and then hopefully shortly after that with full weak physics. And as uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, our first three-dimensional models uh, that I was about to get to here, uh, our first three-dimensional model that was published in 2015 uh, took nine months on Summit. Uh, no, sorry, on Titan, pre the precursor to the Oak Ridge National Laboratory computer. Uh, and of course, we've, we've optimized the code significantly since, and we can run them, uh, as, you know, supernova second in a much shorter period of time and run multiple models a year. But, uh, you know, to go to full weak physics is ultimately, at the end of the day, a matter of whether you can access uh, platforms like Summit, uh, and get a sufficient amount of time on Summit to be able to run uh, a supernova model or several models. So we can't run 
as well show you, a supernova model needs to be run for several seconds. Not half, not one, but several seconds. Uh, we can run three models in a year at about a half second a clip. If we want to continue a model beyond that, we pick one and we continue it year after year after year. That's what we're up against. It's kind of like being somebody who relies on a telescope, a big you know, telescope. We rely, our telescope is Summit. Uh, so now, you know, we're not, uh, you know, a theorist that can sit in a room independent of everything else. Uh, we depend on these instruments. Uh, and that will set the pace for Kay, for me, for all of us going forward. So the community will have to be patient uh, as we begin to churn these models out. So this just briefly, I want to show you a couple of quick things. Uh, here we have three models. Uh, we took a hiatus after we published the first model because we wanted to really fundamentally alter the code to be able to go to very high re angular resolution, which is very important. And now that we've done that, we've, uh, I'm going to show you, we're running multiple models, but here's the results of three. And they have a, they're spread in, in progenitor mass from 10 to 25. So there's a big spread in progenitor mass. Some are zero metal, some are solar metal. So the spread in metallicity, but they're all non-rotating. And in all three cases, with the Chimera code, we see explosion. This is the 9.6 solar mass model. This is the 15, and this is the, sorry, that's the 15, this is the 25. Uh, this is the average shock radius. The spread here indicates the, the gap between the maximum and minimum shock radii, which is an indication of how aspherical the explosion is. So the low mass progenitor is very spherical in nature although not spherical and smaller scales, as I'll show you in a second, whereas the larger mass progenitors are, the, the explosion is, is quite, quite different from that, okay? This, uh, you know, it, it's very difficult to carry out 3D simulations to several seconds, but we have carried out 2D simulations to several seconds, and this is the explosion energy versus time. So if I wanna predict what we call the zeroth observable, which is the explosion energy, did it explode? Okay, maybe that's the zero. The first uh, observable, be, what's the energy? Is it a robust explosion? Does it match observations? I have to follow the simulation, and here's, uh, for example, the, the, uh, the 15 solar mass case here. The explosion energy after two seconds of evolution is still climbing. And that's because you, you have continued accretion uh, from a, a very aspherical region above the proton neutron star continuing to fuel the neutrino luminosities, which continue the heating and continue the positive energy. And so I can't tell you, even after more than two supernova seconds of evolution, what the final explosion energy of that model is. So the days of modeling supernovae for, in, like in Jim Wilson's day, where 500 milliseconds was enough, are long gone. And this is a huge challenge for our community going forward, to not only predict whether the model explodes or not, but to give you quantitative numbers as to you know, what are the fundamental characteristics uh, of it, okay? Again, briefly, I apologize for running over. Uh, I just briefly, the, 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 uh, the gravitational wave signatures from these models, again, spanning mass and, and metallicity, uh, these are really quite different. <laughs> so I remember when Fulvio, Ricci, and I spoke in 2017, that we had run these two models, but not this one. And he came up to me and he said, you know, as I said, he said, there's been a lot of progress. He said, you even have a template. So this is the high frequency uh, signature and the low frequency signature that you saw in, in, in Pablo's talk earlier. But this is the 9.6 solar mass case. And the, the uh, strain versus time uh, in this case, and also the heat map, is really complementary in the sense that the dominant emission in the 9.6 solar mass case happens within the first 75 milliseconds after bounce. Okay? And you see that in the heat map. There is a semblance, though, of, of these two features that you see here. This is the uh, uh, high frequency emission from the proton neutron star. And this is the low frequency emission from the SASE and from explosion. It's very prominent in both these cases. It's still here. But the very early uh, uh, heat map here is not realistic. And it's not realistic because these models were begun with spherical progenitors. The 9.6 model 
uh, is initiated in spherical symmetry, but it, it's, uh, its core profiles are such that you have nuclear burning that occurs during collapse, which then uh, in, it instantiates perturbations in the core, and then when the shock wave hits those perturbations, you get all hell breaks loose, okay? So when 3D models in the future are run with 3D progenitors, this is gonna fill in, in my opinion. All of this is gonna fill in, it's gonna start to look more like this. So uh, this just shows you the challenge we have in that we can't just simulate one or two cases. We really have quite a bit to, to do in order to get a full picture of the gravitational wave emission let alone the improvements that are needed to quantitatively improve on this, okay? Uh, and uh, this is the detectability, which I'll skip. Now, there's one last thing I'll mention, and then I'll shut up. Um, okay, so basically, uh, there are two groups that have, uh, ours and the Max Planck group, that have endeavored to isolate the contributions of the gravitational wave emission to specific regions in the core, okay? And the fact of the matter is 3D changes the picture completely. In 2D, and I think this is what Pablo was referring to earlier when he had the hammer hitting the bell, uh, in 2D, the dominant emission comes from excitation of the proton star from above. That is not the case in 3D. In 3D, the, it's fundamentally different. In 3D, the excitation uh, occurs from within. You have, here we have a Ledoux unstable region. This is Ledoux convectively unstable. The overshoot region above it, which would be a buoyancy driven region, right? This is uh, at a density of 10 to the 12. This is a, a density of 10 to the 11, uh, otherwise known as the proto-neutron star surface, ha ha. I mean, that is, uh, you know, I'll show you just what we're up against in making assumptions about what to call the proto-neutron star in a second. And this is the gain radius, and this is the, sh the shock heating region. This is where the SASE, for example, occurs, and then the shock is farther out. So uh, here is a breakdown of the strain from this model. This is the Ledoux unstable region. It dominates the strain, not the, not the Ledoux stable region, not the convective overshoot region. So first of all, to say that, first of all, both of these regions contribute to the gravitational wave emission, clearly, and Andreessen et al. agrees with that. Who says which one dominates, we differ, but the bottom line is both contribute significantly to it, okay? Now, this, the Brun-Weisler frequency, which is the basis of this formula from Euler et al., is based on the assumption of buoyancy-driven oscillations which is valid for this region, not for this. The, the brunt weisler frequency in the unstable case is a growth rate. It's not, a, it's not an oscillation frequency, okay? Uh, and we basically took this formula and we fit this formula at 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12, and 10 to the 13 grams per cubic centimeter. We know what the M and the R are at those in our model. And the best fit and I say that loosely because clearly this is not replacing a, a detailed analysis like Pablo showed, the best fit for us occurs at a density of 10 to the 13 grams per cubic centimeter. 10 to the 13. So, so at the, if you look at where this starts and stops, it's very similar to what we have here. So it, 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 it is fine to talk about the peak frequency evolution, but to claim that that's the M and the R there. Maybe this is a way to define the proto-neutron star, M and R, through the gravitational wave analysis because this is, the, this is the result when I do this at 10 to the 11, which is defined by us, we modelers, at, in an ad hoc way to be the proto-neutron star surface. It doesn't fit with this. So if we use, if we observe this, and we assume that this is coming from 10 to the 11, we're going to extract all the wrong information. The fact of the matter is, when we observe this, this information is coming from much deeper down, excited from within the proto-neutron star, not from outside, although that's still, that, that exists, that, that perturbation exists as well, but it doesn't dominate. And I think Pablo said something very important this morning which made me happy, because as Andreessen and Al has pointed out and we've worried about, what does R1 have to do with this frequency when it's from the unstable region? 
It has nothing to do with it. But because these are adjacent regions, they're coupled. And Pablo was talking about that, that, that when you have two adjacent regions, they are coupled. And that interaction, I think, is why we're able to take a formula that assumes buoyancy-driven oscillations and fit it to uh, gravitational wave emission from regions that have nothing to do with buoyancy because they're coupled. Uh, so uh, the point is that there's, there's a, a lot more, as Shakespeare said, there's a lot more in this universe than is dreamt of in our philosophy. 3D has fundamentally altered this picture. And, and we shouldn't talk about gravitational waves as, as if we're sort of wringing the proto-neutron star from the outside. I'm going to stop there. Uh, and and uh, the, the, as I wanted to point out there, besides Ledoux convection, there are these doubly diffusive instabilities that may occur. And they occur when you have cross gradients. And they occur through a competition of, uh, it it's only happens when you have neutrino transport uh, that carry energy and lepton number. And uh, a blob and its surroundings can exchange entropy and lepton number through neutrino transport. And as a result of that competition, hence the name doubly diffusive instabilities, you can have additional instabilities which are not Ledoux convection and which extend the unstable region beyond the Ledoux convective region. And in some of the models that have been published, this may be present. It's kind of like the SASE when it was discovered in 2003. The SASE was always present in the, in the two-dimensional models from the 1990s. It just wasn't known that it was there. It could be very well be that Ledoux instability, these um, doubly diffusive instabilities are in, have occurred in the models. That re will require a lot more work to discern that. And we should be very careful about conclusions we make based on assuming that it's only Ledoux convection. So it further enriches the, and complexifies things. And then I'll stop.